This is a video about the parole evidence rule. And incidentally, this is a rule of the law of contracts. It's not an evidence rule, even though it's called the parole evidence rule. The rule provides that statements made prior to or contemporaneously with the signing of a contract may not be used to add to, vary, or contradict the contract if the writing, the contract writing, is integrated. So to say that in a different way, if the writing is integrated, statements made prior to or contemporaneously with the signing of the writing may not be used to add to vary or contradict the terms. So the next question becomes, well, what do we mean by if the writing is integrated? And a writing is integrated if the writing is intended as the final and complete expression of the parties on the subject. So whether or not the writing is integrated depends on the intent of the parties. They need to intend for it to be final. That means that the writing is not a draft. They intended for it to be complete, and that means that uh, it was, uh, you intended for everything to be there. You did not intend to add more stuff later. So it's not a draft, and you didn't intend to add anything more. It's complete, and if that's what you intended, it's integrated. And if the writing is integrated, then things which you said prior to or contemporaneously with the signing may not be used to add to, vary, or contradict the terms of the contract. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. One example is a bar question in which a homeowner was uh, having a house built, and the contracts and the specifications had been drawn up and so forth. And at the signing, the owner said to the builder, now, I want to be sure this is done within 90 days. Uh, the builder didn't really say anything. Now, is that 90 days, is that a part of the contract or not? If that's not part of the contract, then the builder has to finish within a reasonable time. If it is part of the contract, then the builder needs to finish within 90 days. So is that statement that we just talked about that was made contemporaneously with the execution or the signing of the contract, is that statement, can that be used to add to, vary, or contradict the terms? And the answer is that if the writing was intended to be integrated, no. <coughs> and uh, in this, in the problem was set up in such a way that the builder actually finished in 95 days. And part of what you had to decide is whether or not the builder was five days in breach or not. And if the 90 days is a part of the contract, the builder is in breach. If the 90 days is not a part of the contract, 95 days was a reasonable time to finish, and there is no breach. A uh, second example. Now, please notice, uh, it was a second example. There is a bar question in which a company, a research company, was engaged in uh, uh, some research that involved uh, toxic waste as an outcome of the research. And that toxic waste uh, needed to be emptied, and so the research company had a contract with a <coughs> waste disposal company that uh, they were to come and empty the toxic waste within 48 hours of when they got notice uh, to come and do it. And it was supposed to be, you know, like if it's uh, almost full, like 80% full or something. If it's almost full, then they call the, uh, the disposal company. They're supposed to come within 48 hours. Now, at the signing of this five-year contract, the waste disposal company person said, uh, now, this 48-hour rule does not apply to holiday weekends. And again, the uh, uh, the research company people didn't really respond to that. And later on, uh, the question arose, uh, 
does the 48-hour rule apply to holiday weekends? In other words, if the 48 hours ends on Christmas Day, do you still have to em empty the toxic waste within 48 hours? Or does it not apply on holiday weekends? Well, uh, so the question is, and this, this, was a, this statement was made contemporaneously with the signing, and so the question becomes, uh, is this statement that it does not apply to holiday weekends, is that a part of the contract or not? And of course, the bar examiner set up the facts in such a way that on a holiday weekend, uh, the company called and they wanted this stuff emptied. And the disposal company said, we won't empty it until the day afterwards. And the question is, was that a breach or not? And whether or not that was a breach is going to turn <coughs> on whether or not <coughs> the statement, uh, you know, this doesn't apply to holiday weekends, is that a part of the contract or not? And again, uh, under the parole evidence rule, the answer would be no, because it was a, it's a contemporaneous statement uh, made at the time of the signing of the contract, and that cannot be used to add to, vary, or contradict the terms of the contract. So in both cases, the statement made at the signing would not end up being included because uh, of the parole evidence rule. Here's another example. There was a bar question in which an accountant was going to uh, uh, get a job working for an accounting firm at the rate of $15,000 per year. This was an older question when that was a reasonable amount of money to pay somebody. Uh, <clears throat> and so the, the accountant got an offer from the accounting firm, and the offer says, we offer you employment with this firm beginning uh, you know, August 1st or something. Well, before the accountant accepted, before they you know, returned the, the note and saying, I accept, the, uh, the firm, the accounting firm called the accountant and said, by the way, if you decide to accept this contract, we want you to be, stay for a year. We'd like for you to stay for a year. We require that you stay for a year. And again, the accountant didn't say anything. But here, we have a statement that was made prior to <coughs> the signing, the you know, uh, execution of the contract, prior to the time that the accountant signed saying, yes, I accept. So now we have a statement that fits this criteria, statements made prior to the time that the contract was formed. And is that one year, we, we, we require that you stay for one year, is that a part of the contract or not? And uh, under the parole evidence rule, the answer is no, because this, this changes the terms of the contract. And so we're using a statement that was made prior to the signing of the contract to add to, vary, or contradict the terms. So the answer is no. In all three cases, that material, that parole evidence would not be admitted. Now, uh, one of the major problems that occurs in these parole evidence rule problems is intent to integrate. Did the parties intend for this writing to be their final and complete expression on the subject or not? And there are three possibilities that you need to be aware of for bar exam purposes. Number one, the contract uh, might have a merger clause. And if it has a merger clause, the merger clause says this writing is intended by the parties to be integrated their final and complete expression. So if you have a merger clause, that settles the matter, unless two possibilities. One is sometimes you have a long form contract and this merger clause is buried down in the contract someplace. <clears throat> There's a good chance that the person didn't even read it. This is particularly true in consumer transactions where you're buying a car or something and it's maybe a they're buying it on time and there's a contract and there's a, it's got 10 pages to it and you know you didn't read it all. <coughs> the, uh, so if the merger clause is part of a form contract, the courts are, are less likely to enforce it because there's a good chance a person didn't read it. Secondly, if the merger clause is the product of fraud, that is if you've misled the person <coughs> to in some way and they sign the merger clause as a part of this uh, intentional misrepresentation, 
then the merger clause, of course, would be void because it was a product of fraud. The other two issues that come up regarding intent to integrate, intent to make this writing the final and complete expression of the parties, are the two views as to how you determine the intent of the parties. The majority view is the Williston view as to how you determine the intent of the parties, and there's a minority view, the Corbin view, which is also the restatement of judgment's view on how to determine the intent of the parties, intent to integrate. The Williston view, the rule is what we call the Four Corners Rule, jokingly. And what the Four Corners Rule says is that you look at the document itself. <clears throat> Do not look outside the document and four corners just because the document has four corners. And uh, within the four corners of the document, if that forms a contract that is rational for these two people and their circumstances, if this is a contract that these two people might have entered into under these circumstances, uh, then that is the contract. If it's a contract that they might have entered into, that is the, the contract. And you cannot, and they intended for that to be the final, uh, to be integrated, and you cannot add to their contradict uh, in violation of the parole evidence rule. So the Four Corners Rule says, in a se essence, if there is a contract within the four corners of the document that these people might have entered into reasonably, rationally, then that is the contract and uh, you don't, and the parole evidence rule excludes other things. This is the majority rule. A minority view, supported by the restatement, is the Corbin view. This is a more modern view. This is older, this is more modern. And the Corbin view, Corbin says, what, if you want to know what people intended, don't go put form over substance like Williston is doing. Instead, what you should do is to make an effort to determine their real intent. And that the legal system has a lot of experience in determining people's intent. It happens all the time. When you have intentional torts, you have to determine their intent. In criminal law, you often have to determine their intent. So there are lots of situations where <clears throat> the intent of the parties controls ambiguity. If a statement is ambiguous, you try to figure out what the parties intended, because that's what controls. So you see, Carbon's view is we have a lot of experience in the legal system in determining people's intent. So what we should do is to uh, determine the true intent of the people. In other words, if someone uh, is, uh, uh, if, if you, the question is, did they intend for this document to be integrated? Let's try to figure out what they really intended. And so the Corbin view says what we do is we admit all relevant evidence to determine the actual intent of the parties. And that's what you go on. So you, so you can admit anything that's relevant to determine the intent. And once you've determined the intent, if you determine that the, the document was integrated, then you cannot add to, very or contradicted with statements that were made prior to or contemporaneously with the signing. If, on the other hand, under the Corbin view to determine that the parties did not intend for the document to be integrated, then you can bring in you can bring in whatever statements you want to, but please keep in mind that if you bring in outside statements, the outside statements that you bring in, the parole statements that you bring in, cannot contradict the writing. They can add to it. But if you have a writing, you can't contradict that writing. Uh, and uh, unless, of course, the writing was not a contract. I mean, if it wasn't. But if you've signed a contract, and the contract contains some of the terms, uh, and you want to add new terms, you can't contradict the ones that are there. Uh, the other subject, which is frequently tested along with uh, the parole evidence rule, is ambiguity. Now, a statement is ambiguous when it has more than one meaning. And uh, the ambiguity can, can be a word but the ambiguity can also be a phrase, and so keep this in mind. The other thing to keep in mind for bar purposes is that, uh, a, that people do not ordinarily <coughs> form contracts with people when they know that there's an ambiguous term in the writing. 
they'll talk to each other and try to clear that up. And so the ambiguity that you're going to get on the bar exam is going to look like something that didn't appear to be ambiguous at first. So please keep that in mind. But it turned out to be ambiguous all after. Anyway, I'll give you some examples of that in just a minute. But where there is ambiguity, the intent of the parties controls. What they were trying to say controls. And how do we determine the intent of the parties? Well, we have several possibilities. One is the parties might tell you what their intent is. There was a famous case involving a stockbroker who uh, had a, made an arrangement with a, a client who didn't want the other people in the office to know what he was buying and selling. And so this, this client says, look, when I call in and I say buy, I really mean sell. And when I call in and I say sell, I really mean buy. And it, they could prove that this is what the parties uh, agreed on. And then, of course, sooner or later, it got mixed up and somebody bought when they should have sold. Uh, and there's a lawsuit. And here is an example where there was expressed intent as to what the parties meant by those words. And so their expressed intent applies, if you've got it. Secondly, keep in mind that when a document is ambiguous, it is interpreted against the drafter. That makes sense. Whoever drafted it is interpreted against that person. Finally, and this is the part that is typically tested, is this part here, that you can use the conduct of the parties to determine their intent. And uh, the, if there's been some conduct. In, we have course of performance, course of dealing, and, course of, and custom in the industry, and the bar examiners want you to know about these three. Course of performance is the case where in the course of performing this very same contract between these very same people, that this same issue has come up in the past in performing this contract. And you look at, well, how did these people deal with this issue when it came up before? And that certainly helps you determine what they intended by the ambiguity. Let me give you an example. In the 48-hour example that I gave you here just a minute ago, over here, this case, this was a case where the research company, as I mentioned, was producing toxic waste and the disposal company was supposed to uh, pick it up within 48 hours after getting notice. And the disposal company says at the signing, this does not apply to holiday weekends. Well, uh, this, was, this suit came down in the fourth year of the contract, the five-year contract. And during that four years, there had been a number of occasions, three or four occasions, where <coughs> The, uh, the, the 48, hour, 48 hours ended in a holiday weekend. And the disposal company did not pick up within 48 hours. They picked it up the next day. And there was no complaint from the research company. And so in the course of these same two people performing this very same contract, this issue about what does 48 hours really mean came up several times. And each time they came up, they did not empty within 48 hours. And that gives you some idea of what the parties intended by the 48 hours. On the facts I gave you, it looks like the uh, parties did not intend for the 48-hour rule to apply on holiday weekends. But course of performance means same contract, same people, same issue. What did you do in the past? Course of dealing is another device to help determine the intent of the parties. Course of dealing you use when it's a different contract but between the same people and the same issue has come up. So if these people have contracted before on, and this same issue came up in other contracts, how did these same people deal with this same issue in other contracts? And that's what this is about, obviously. That can help determine the intent of the parties. And finally, uh, custom in the industry, certain terms uh, are interpreted in a particular way in the industry. It's customary that that's the way that term is interpreted. For example, in the industry that we were talking about with the 48 hours, does 48 hours in that industry ordinarily include Christmas Day? Or you don't, you don't include holiday weekends? So you might, that might be helpful. Also terms which are specialty terms to the industry, plumbing terms, architectural terms, etc. We would look at the custom in the industry to interpret those terms. So if you, with regard to ambiguity, 
the basic rule is that the intent of the parties controls. The question is, how do you determine the intent of the parties? And the answer is what we just talked about. Let me give you uh, a couple of more examples, one more example at least. Uh, I, first, I want to point out that ambiguity and the parole evidence rule are often tested together. And the reason they are tested together is because if you and I are forming a contract and either contemporaneously with the signing of the contract or while we are negotiating prior to or contemporaneously with, I make some statement about the contract, that statement has two possible ways it might be used. One is we might use this parole statement that I made to clarify what some term of the contract means. And secondly, we might use my parole statement to try to add to, vary, or contradict. So if I try to add this parole statement to the contract, parole evidence rule applies. If I try to use this parole statement to clarify some, some term in the contract, the parole evidence rule does not apply because I am not using parole statements to add to, vary, or contradict the terms. I'm just using it to clarify what the term meant. Uh, now, a couple of examples of that. Here in the 48 hours that we were talking about, there was an out, there was a statement made at the time of the signing that the, uh, the parties, uh, that it doesn't apply to holiday weekends. And this can easily be viewed as uh, the, uh, the disposal company uh, clarifying what is meant by 48 hours. And if you see it as clarifying an ambiguous term, then uh, the parole evidence rule does not apply. And of course, you can use outside statements to clarify a term. $15,000 per year. Well, the uh, accountant who uh, accepted this job at $15,000 per year turned out that uh, before the accountant even started to work, the accounting firm lost one of its big clients and they wrote back to the accountant and saying, we're not hiring you anyway because we don't have the work anymore. And so now the question is, did this account have a one-year contract? If so, he's going to get paid, you know, minus duty to mitigate damages, or not. Did the, so what happened in this case is that the accountant got the offer in the mail. And before signing the offer, so the contract hasn't been formed yet, this is prior to the formation of the contract, it hasn't been formed. So he's got the offer in the mail. Before signing, he gets a telephone call. Telephone call says, we want you to stay for a year if you accept this. And so, is that a part of the contract or not? Well, uh, we've decided that under the parole evidence rule, no, that's not going to come in. However, under looking at it as an ambiguous term, you can see that the term $15,000 per year, this is ambiguous because does $15,000 per year refer only to the rate of pay? Or do you have a job for a year because of that term? And part of the reason that's ambiguous is because historically, uh, if you go back a couple hundred years or so, jobs, when people got jobs, they were long-term jobs. I mean, they were for life in many, in many countries. And if not, they were considered, you know, permanent. <coughs> so when you, when you uh, uh, and this idea that people are dispensable in the sense that uh, jobs are at will and they come and go at will, that's a fairly modern concept. And so uh, uh, if you look in places like the Midwest where uh, at the time this question was written, which is about 25 years ago, at the time that question was written, if you go to the Midwest, you would find some settings where people were still looking at jobs in terms of the history that they came from, their long term, more likely to be permanent. Whereas in the cities, in the big cities, you'd see it in the urban settings, uh, jobs are considered more at will if you don't say anything. And so you can see how a person might interpret the 15,000 per year as I got a job for a year. And you may interpret it, nope, it doesn't have anything to do with how long you got a job. <clears throat> so this is ambiguous. How do you interpret that ambiguity? Well, we, uh, in the case of 15,000 per year, we don't have course of performance. We don't have course of dealing. But we do have custom in the industry. How does the industry interpret that 15,000 per year? And you could use that to try to clarify what the 15,000 per year meant.
But the point, key point here is that the $15,000 per year can get used to clarify an ambiguity, even though it cannot get used to add to, vary, or contradict the terms of the contract. So in these cases where the parole evidence rule is being tested, uh, the great majority of cases, in fact, all the ones I can think of at the moment, the bar has tested, they are testing the parole evidence rule and ambiguity both. You need to write about both. And the reason you almost always need to write about both is because this outside statement, this parole statement, it can be in writing, it can be, I mean, it's not part of the contract, but it can be written, it can be oral. However the parole, parole statement came about, that, that statement can be used maybe in two ways. One way is to add to, vary, or contradict the terms of the contract, then you apply the parole evidence rule. On the other hand, you can use that statement to clarify something that the contract means, uh, clarify a term in the contract, in which case the parole evidence rule does not apply. And one final statement, of course, the parole evidence rule does not apply uh, in other situations where you, the outside statement is not being used to add to, vary, or contradict the terms. For example, uh, <coughs> fraud is an exception, by the way. Uh, so the parole evidence rule does not permit you, per, uh, prevent you from bringing in evidence to show fraud. But secondly, what about things like you and I form a contract, and the deal is that this entire contract okay, uh, is null and void you know, until some event takes place. And if the contract is, doesn't even take effect until a certain event takes place, and, and that's an outside statement. It's made outside the contract, and orally. We say this contract has, is not in effect until this event takes place. Well, that statement that the contract doesn't apply until the event occurs, you can bring that in because you're not adding to, varying, or contradicting the terms of the contract. You're saying, when does the contract become uh, operative? You're not changing the terms. And so that's a situation where parole evidence rule does not apply. Also, if, you, if the contract says, uh, 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 this, I, I convey Black Acre to you for $100,000, which I acknowledge has been received, and then go on to say other things about the deed. So in the writing, I acknowledge that I've got the money, I received it. But in fact, I never got it. Okay. Now, can the parole evidence rule be used to show that uh, uh, that uh, that's not true? I'm contradicting the terms. I got the hundred thousand, and the answer is yes. It can be used to show that, and the reason it can be used to show that is because uh, I'm not adding to, varying, or contradicting the terms of the contract. I'm showing that it wasn't performed. Now, the, uh, in other words, what I'm saying is that when I write in the contract. Uh, $100,000, which I acknowledge I have received, okay, that's not a term of the contract, that's performance. The term of the contract is I promise to do something for you, and you promise to do something for me. But when I say in the contract, you know, I acknowledge you've already done so and so, that's not a term of the contract. That's just acknowledging that you've done some performance. And so that you can use the parole evidence rule. You, uh, it does not violate the parole evidence rule to bring in evidence that I didn't get the $100,000, even though the writing says I did get it. Um, that's about it. Uh, and um, it, um, uh, keep in mind that when you look for both parole evidence rule and ambiguity, also under the uh, parole evidence rule, the bar examiners typically want to be sure that you show them that you know the Williston and the Corbin split. And finally, on the ambiguity, those three devices for clarifying ambiguity. And that is the end of this tape.